Hey guys, Carlson here to start our conversations about the urinary system, which is covered in chapter 18 of your textbook. We're going to cover 18.1 through 18.4 today in our first video lecture, so let's go ahead and get started. And most of the organic waste products of the blood are removed by the urinary system, and that's the big picture or uh, purpose of it itself. But um, there are three main functions, and the urinary system consists of the kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra to make these functions happen. So, those three main functions are excretion, elimination, and homeostatic regulation. The kidneys are basically what perform the excretion part or the removal of the organic waste by, uh, from body fluids. And then elimination is done by the bladder and the urethra, and this happens through urination or micturition. Now, homeostatic regulations, the main overall big picture is to remove those organic waste generated by cells, but it also regulates blood volume and pressure, uh, plasma concentrations of sodium, potassium chloride, and other ions, helps stabilize blood pH, and conserves uh, valuable nutrients. Now, the kidneys are highly vascular organs containing functional units called nephrons. These nephrons are the part of the system that performs filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. The kidney, um, whenever we think of something related to the kidney, we use that word renal. It refers to the kidney. So uh, the kidneys are located on either side of the vertebral column, as you can see here. Um, the right often sits a little bit lower and they're retroperitoneal, they're between the peritoneal lining and muscles of the dorsal body. Uh, the position is maintained, maintained by the overlying peritoneum, which is in contact with the adjacent organs and also the supporting connective tissues. Now, these, uh, the organs in the supporting tissues can sometimes cause the kidney to displace themselves, which uh, stresses attached blood vessels and the ureter, and this uh, disorder is basically called a floating kidney. The anatomy of the kidney, it's reddish brown, it's about 10 centimeters long, 5.5 centimeters wide, and 3 centimeters thick in adults. It weighs about 150 grams, and the hilium is the site of the ureter exit. The fibrous capsule is what is going to cover um, the entire kidney, and it's divided into an outer cortex, okay, and the inner medulla. And so you can see the medulla area here. Now, the inner medulla is made up of about 16 to 18 of these pyramids, which are kind of a more purplish color. Um, the tips of those pyramids are called the renal papilla. And then a, one renal lobe consists of the cortex and the pyramid that it encompasses of that inner medulla. Now, urine production occurs here in the pyramids, um, and the nephrons are involved with that. Uh, as well as the overlying areas of the cortex that are within that uh, lobe. And here is where you can see one functional unit of the kidney, or what we call a nephron, about 1.25 million of those per kidney, if, which if you stretch them all out would be 85 miles in length. And finally, um, once we have that urine production and it is filtered through, it drains into cup-shaped calyces, so this is a minor uh, calyx, and then the major calyx is the, the larger open area that will drain into the renal pelvis, to the ureter, and out of the kidney. All right, now blood supply to the kidneys. Uh, it is well supplied with blood since part of their function is to filter out waste in the blood. About 20 to 25% of the cardiac output, which is 12 milliliters per minute, it receives blood from the renal artery, uh, originating from the abdominal aorta, and then blood reaches each nephron through an afferent arterial and leaves in an efferent arterial. So uh, try to think of efferent as being like the exit to help you remember the difference between the two of those. The nephron itself is made up of two main parts. It begins at the renal corpuscle and leads into the renal tubule. Uh, the corpuscle is a round structure composed of the glomerular capsule and the glomerulus. Remember, the glomerular capsule is also known as Bowman's capsule. Uh, here, blood pr pressure forces fluid and dissolved solutes out of the glomerulus capillaries and into the surrounding capillar space, and this is a process of filtration that we talked about. The tubule now is made up of the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT, the nephron loop, or loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. And as filtrate travels through these tubules, it changes into something we call tubular fluid. Each nephron will then empty into the collecting duct, which is the start of the collecting system. This duct leaves the cortex and extends to the medulla. 
uh, that carries fluid from many nephrons towards the papillary duct that delivers what is now urine to the calyces and then renal pelvis and obviously out of the kidney through the ureter like we just mentioned. Now here's a diagram of a, neuron, a nephron and here's that renal corpuscle we talked about with the glomerulus. Uh, the efferent are the efferent going in, the efferent arterial going out. You have your proximal convoluted tubule, uh, your distal convoluted tubule, and that loop of Henle in between. Finally, your collecting system starting with that collecting duct, the papillary duct, into that minor calyx. Um, one note about that glomerular structure here: it, the epithelium covering it, it consists of podocytes. That word, po that prefix "podo" means foot. And uh, basically, these pedicels uh, that we call feet wrap around the capillaries. And uh, those capillaries are also known to be fenestrated because they contain pores. And this is part of what helps that filtration process or forms that filtration membrane. And that membrane is going to permit movement of water, waste, ions, glucose, fatty acids, etc. But blood cells, plasma, proteins, and other valuable solutes are going to be reabsorbed uh, by that proximal convoluted tubule to be used uh, throughout the body. All right, now the overview of the nephron function. I want you to kind of jot down this table, maybe shorten up the functions, but kind of know in what region what function happens. But overall, it reabsorbs all the useful organic molecules or nutrients from the filtrate, reabsorbs over 90% of the water in the filtrate, and secretes into the tubular fluid any waste products that were missed by the filtration process. All right, so 18.3 is going to cover the different portions of the nephron that form urine uh, by filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Um, the primary purpose of urine production is to maintain homeostasis by regulating the volume and composition of blood, and this involves excretion of dissolved solutes, especially the following three metabolic waste products. There's urea, which is the most abundant organic waste, 21 grams each day, uh, mostly caused from the uh, breaking down of amino acids. Uh, creatinine uh, is generated in the skeletal muscle tissue. Remember we talked about this. Uh, it's from the breakdown of creatine phosphate that helps us energize muscle contractions. That's about 1.8 grams per day. And finally, uric acid. It's a product of the breakdown and recycling of RNA, and that's only about 480 milligrams each day. The nephron process, uh, again, the filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, you can kind of take a look at these diagrams. I'm not going to talk about them in much detail here because we're going to do something uh, with this in class to kind of get you to understand how that works. And then the filtration at the glomerulus, remember the renal corpuscle that contains the glomerulus is that site of filtration. Uh, for this to occur, filtration pressure has to be greater than osmotic pressure of blood. And the process of filtrate production at the glomerulus is called the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. That's the amount of filtrate produced in the kidneys each minute. There's about 125 milliliters produced each minute, and the course of the singular glomeruli generates 180 liters of filtrate, where over 99% of that filtrate is reabsorbed. The properties of norm, normal urine I just want you to be familiar with, such as pH is about 4.5 to 8, uh, average is about a 6, so close to neutral. Um, the specific gravity, um, water content is about 93 to 97%. The volume per day color is normally a clear yellow. And the bacterial content is none. It should be sterile, unless you might have some kind of urinary infection. All right, the last part we're going to cover uh, in 18.4, normal kidney function depends on that glomerular filtration rate, and there's three levels of control for that GFR. There's autoregulation, hormonal regulation, and autonomic regulation. Okay, so we're going to talk about each one of these in detail, and autoregulation is also known as local regulation, which compensates for minor variations in blood pressure through automatic changes in the diameter of the afferent arterioles, the efferent arterioles, and the glomerular capillaries. An example of this would be a reduction in blood flow and decline in uh, glomerular filtration pressure would trigger dilation of afferent arterial and glomerular capillaries to keep that GFR constant. Now, hormonal control uh, is a result in long-term adjustments in blood pressure and blood volume that stabilize GFR. The main hormones involved in that um, in kidney regulation is angiotensin II, ald aldosterone, ADH, and ADP. Now, these are all integrated by the renin-angiotensin system, which we're going to talk about real quick here. Now, the effects of the angiotensin II will elevate blood pressure in the renal arteries, uh, trigger constriction of the efferent arterioles to elevate glomerular pressures and filtration rates. 
will trigger the release of that ADH. The ADH is going to stimulate the reabsorption of water and sodium ions and then induce thirst. Stimulates secretion of aldosterone, uh, which creates a sudden dramatic increase in the systemic blood pressure. And then finally, AMP, which opposes the renin-angiotensin system when the blood pressures are too high. All right, now the last part we're going to talk about is that sympathetic activation by the A and S. Uh, primarily serves to shift blood flow away from the kidneys, which lowers the GFR. The direct effect of this is powerful constriction of the afferent ar arterioles that's triggered by a sudden crisis, uh, like a heart attack. Um, th this action can override local regulations, but will return to normal once crisis passes. And then the indirect effect is blood flow to the kidneys. And uh, this is especially pronounced during strenuous exercise. It can create problems for endurance athletes like marathon runner, runners or long distance swimmers, basically because metabolic waste will build up over the long course of the event. Uh, protein will commonly be lost in the urine. Blood could be seen because of this, but the problems will usually disappear in 48 hours. Um, so it's not you know, something that should prolong, but if it does, it could cause renal failure. 18.5 is where I'll pick up next time, so go ahead and pause, uh, uh, repeat, play as needed, uh, draw where it helps you to make sense of the system, and we'll catch back up with you later.